We are going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you can open up to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. These are the words of God to us. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament, with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Father God, we thank you for your word spoken to us. God, we thank you for um, Jesus Christ, the living word. And we pray this morning that, that we would know your Holy Spirit bringing these words alive to us, that you would be the one who is speaking who is guiding us, who is shaping our lives, that we would know you pastoring us this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the most part, um, we all kind of look our age, right? Within, you know, maybe a, a five, ten year variance, right? We, we tend to look about how old we actually are. There aren't Um, many five-year-olds who get mistaken for being in their 30s, right? And there's not very many 75-year-olds who get mistaken for being in their 20s, except except for in this room. (laughs) We, We tend to kind of look how old we are. Our body matures year by year, and nothing we can do is actually going to stop that, right? No matter how hard we might try. But this is not true of all areas of our life. Just because another year passes doesn't mean that every other area of our life is going to automatically mature and grow. We could be a people who are spiritually stunted, people who are intellectually stunted, emotionally stunted, socially stunted, right? Just because we grow up physically doesn't mean we have grown up in all areas of our life. And I think most of us could think of people that we know um, that you would say, yeah, they've they've grown in some areas, but other areas, man, they're like a child still, (laughs) right? And hopefully no one is thinking that of us this morning. This is true of our walk with the Lord, that we could walk with him year after year after year and still not always be actually maturing in him. We could be a Christian for 20 years, um, but like I've heard people reflect on, in, instead of being a Christian that's like a 20-year-old Christian, we're more like a one-year-old qu- Christian who has just lived the same year 20 times. 
We can grow in some areas of our life with Christ and think that that means that we're progressing in all areas. We can think, I'm studying the, the Bible, I'm serving, I'm, I'm involved in Bible studies, um, I, I must be growing. We could even be experiencing God's presence in real powerful and tangible ways. We could be people who are really good at apologetics, right? At, at arguing and defending our faith and what we believe. We could be people who, who serve in children's ministry and on the worship team and on council and serve and care for the homeless and the poor. And there can still be areas of our life and our walk with Jesus where there are major deficits. We see here in Ephesians 4 that maturity really is the goal. Maturity is the goal. Paul talks about things like being built up, the body of Christ being built up, so that we come to maturity and measure up to the full stature of Jesus Christ, that our life would grow to be like the life of Jesus Christ. Paul speaks of no longer being children or infants, but that we would be a people who, who grow to maturity. That we would be speaking the truth in love and grow in every way, not just in some ways, but that we would be a people who grow in every way to be like Jesus, the one who is the head. That as each part of the body works together properly, that this would promote our growth it would promote our growth being built up in love. We are meant to be a people who grow and mature, who measure up to the fullness of all that Jesus is. The sermon series that we're kicking off this morning that we're going to be in for the next um, seven weeks is a sermon series on emotionally healthy spirituality. Um, and it's a series that is um, based on a book, um, a book that I really encourage you guys to read through with us over these next seven weeks. It's a book by a pastor, Pete Scazzaro. Um, and in this book, the kind of his, his thesis or his premise, really a bold statement that he makes, um, is that we cannot be spiritually mature if we remain emotionally immature, right? This idea that we need to be a people who mature in all areas, like Paul spoke of in Ephesians chapter four, not just in one or two areas of our life, but that the goal, the desire, the aim of our life is that we would mature in all areas. And so we want to be a people who, who take a good look at our lives and they were able to see where there might be deficits, where there might be areas in our life and in our walk um, where there is still growth, maturing that needs to happen. Like Paul said, that we want to grow in every way into Jesus. But the problem is that we do have emotional and spiritual deficits in our life. There's just no way around it. We have deficits. It's like um, the analogy of an iceberg, a great analogy for our lives, that there is this top 10 or 15% of our life uh, that people can see, right? But the reality is that there is some um, 85, 90% of our life that's below the surface, that's not easily noticed, um, that we can get by without people always seeing, but that is the, the foundation of who we are, and it affects everything about us. And as the church, we oftentimes uh, focus on that top 10% of our life, right? Making sure that, that when we come to Jesus, we kind of clean up the rough edges, right? The things that um, people notice right away. And so we might be a people who, who clean up our language. We try to clean up uh, the way we, we talk and act around people. Uh, but the reality is that there continues to be so much beneath the surface in our lives that still needs to be touched by the healing and freeing hand of Jesus, right? So much of our past, our, our family of origin, so much of how we relate to other people, so much to do with, with our emotions um, that still needs to be transformed by the Lord. 
these are all things that aren't going to be fixed and solved um, just real easily with quick fixes. We need a deep transformational work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul knew this when he wrote his letters. He knew that there is so much of our lives that needs to be submitted to the Lord, that needs to be given over to him. And that's why he talks so much about maturing and growing up. Paul wasn't happy with just surface level change, but he really wanted the entire body of Christ, all of us for the entirety of our lives to come into the loving hands of Jesus and to be shaped so that we really could be a new people not just an old people with a good facelift, right? But the, the deep stuff of our lives, that in, in that, all the below the surface stuff, that we would be made new in Christ. My own story is one where I grew up in the church. Um, from before I was born, my parents were pastors, so I was really in the church, like all of the time, right? Anytime the doors to the church were open, I was there. I was involved in Bible studies and youth group and Sunday school and teaching Sunday school when I was still a kid. Um, I went on to Bible college to grow and mature in my knowledge of who God was and of scripture. I've been a pastor for many years. Um, but the reality was that even in all of that growing and maturing in my knowledge of God, there was still a lot of areas of my life that still needed to grow and mature. I didn't necessarily know how to handle conflict well. Um, I was uncomfortable saying no to people out of guilt and also wanting to avoid conflict. So I ended up saying yes to a lot of things that I really wish I could say no to. Um, I, I didn't know how to handle um, pain and sorrow and grief and so when I was a teenager and my sister passed away, there was, I didn't know what to do with these feelings of, of anger and doubt and questioning God and deep sorrow and grief. I didn't know where to turn, who to talk to, or how to, to grow and mature uh, through the pain. And later in life, I dealt kind of regularly in college with, with anxiety, um, with panic attacks when life felt out of control. There was a lot of, of emotional growth that I needed, but I didn't know where to turn. And even though I was involved in church, um, oftentimes the things that we talked about together as the people of God weren't addressing a lot of those below the surface things for me. So I had, you know, like all of us, issues with my family of origin, right? No matter how great our families are, um, there's stuff from our past and the way that we were parented and the, the kind of marriages and relationships that we saw growing up uh, that affected my marriage and the way I related to people. In the, the book, uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Schizero talks about um, our feelings and our emotions um, and he said that, that feelings are like children when you are on vacation. You can't put them in the driver's seat or stuff them in the trunk. You have to listen to them, take care of them, protect them, and at times put boundaries on them. And for me, when I um, was, was growing up, I was one of those people who shoved my emotions in the trunk, right? I shoved them in the trunk and tried to ignore them or move past them. But the reality is, um, I think like an analogy that I used a couple months ago, analogy of a hose with the nozzle on the end of it, right? And you can, you can let go of the handle and the stream of water stops. But if you don't turn off the water, right, the, the water pressure builds up in that hose and eventually it's going to come out sideways, right? Eventually it's going to burst through. And so that was kind of my reality, is I left the emotions in the trunk, so to speak, uh, but they started coming out sideways, and usually in the rela my relationships with people that I loved the most, and in dealing with anxiety and panic attacks. And it wasn't until I actually started paying attention to those emotions, actually beginning to unpack those before the Lord, that I began to experience 
Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit coming alongside me and bringing healing and wholeness and restoration. Not because I shoved those things in the trunk or in the closet, but because before the Lord, they were brought out into the light and in relationship with others, I was able to process through the, the deep below the surface stuff that was going on in my life. So I'm on a long road of learning how to handle conflict, learning how to embrace grief and loss and not just bottling it up. All of our lives get to be a journey towards wholeness in Jesus Christ. But we are going to all have different deficits based on our culture, our family background, based on the, the emphasis of Christianity that we experienced in churches throughout our life. Many pastors and theologians here in the U.S. context have kind of identified that for us some of the major deficits that we have are deficits that come to our, our spiritual life and our emotional life. And these spiritual and emotional deficits um, can reveal themselves in many ways. Some of the spiritual deficits typically reveal themselves in too much activity, right? The, the American way of life is to go fast and to go hard, to do more, to be successful, uh, to be driven, success-oriented. If you're not moving, you're dying, right? That's, that's kind of our, our motto in America. And so that, that cultural reality oftentimes becomes our Christian or church reality as well. And so we can tend to be a people who have too much activity in our life with the Lord, and so we give out for God uh, more than we receive from him. Our doing often outpaces our being with God. We're not able to admit when our cup is empty or half full. Right? And so we're left in this place of constantly serving and giving and caring and not ever stopping to admit to the people around us that the well that we're trying to give out from has run dry months or years ago and we're just trying to put on a good face around everyone else. And so when people ask us how we're doing, uh, we say things like, I'm doing better than I deserve. Or in the South, I am blessed abundantly and living in victory, amen, <laughs> right? And all the while, we're just like dry and crumbling inside, but we have to keep up the front and we have to keep serving and giving because that's what good Christians do. Never admitting that a long time ago, the, the fullness of God in us has, has seemed to run dry. Beyond our spiritual deficits, we also have these emotional deficits as a people. And they primarily are seen in a lack of awareness. A lack of awareness of our feelings, our emotions, our desires. A lack of awareness of our weaknesses, of our limits, of how the past impacts our present still. We want to move past our past, but it, it catches up with us a lack of awareness of how other people are experiencing us, right? We all know people that seem to really have a complete lack of self-awareness. Like they don't understand how they come across to all the people around them. Some of our emotional deficits are an awareness um, or a lack of skill to be able to enter deeply into the emotions of other people, their emotions and their perspectives. And so we can become reactionary, not good at empathy, um, not good at handling disagreement. And I think really the last couple of years probably are a really good snapshot into that reality, uh, not only for the church, but for our whole country, right? We can't enter into other people's perspectives or feelings, so instead we have these, these knee-jerk reactions against them. We have emotional deficits that have caused the global tragedy of the last two years, the pandemic, to only be exacerbated. The, the Church of God had an opportunity to, to meet the world at its point of need. Um, and instead, we were a people who were just as emotionally reactive and volatile as the world around us. 
instead of being agents of God's healing and peace and goodness, we often made the situation worse because we had these, these emotional deficits that we didn't know how to deal with our own pain and our own fears and our own frustrations um, alongside the pains and fears and frustrations and hurts of the world around us. So we missed out on our opportunity to be the, the loving, caring hands of Christ in so many opportunities because of these very real emotional and spiritual deficits in our lives. Some of the symptoms or signs that we might have uh, an emotionally unhealthy spirituality instead of one that is um, emotionally healthy are things like using God to run for God. These are, are things that are spelled out in more detail in the book, The Emotionally Healthy Church Spirituality. Uh, but this idea of using God to run from God is that, that we have a, a life with Christ that often looks good to everyone on the outside, and we're doing lots of things for him. We might even be reading scripture a lot, memorizing scripture, digging deep into theology. Uh, but we use those things to keep ourselves busy, to keep God from doing the actual deep work of transformation in our lives. And so we can get caught up in all the outward things of the relationship that we have with Christ to almost keep God at an arm's length because we're afraid of what it might mean for us to slow down and stop and be with him and experience transformation. Some other signs are ignoring uh, the difficult emotions like anger, sadness, fear. We sometimes think that these difficult emotions are even sins to experience or things that we need to quickly move past and we'll even use scripture to justify this. To, to mask over and avoid uh, dealing with these difficult emotions alongside the Holy Spirit. We sometimes die to the wrong things Right? We're a pick people who, who want to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. Uh, but sometimes we think that we, that means we have to make sacrifices that Jesus isn't asking us to make. And so sometimes we die to things that he didn't ask us to die to, uh, like, like good relationships and rest and, and being restored in his presence and enjoying life, good desires desires for friendship, for connection, for rest, for fun, things that bring life and joy and renewal. And so we start shriveling up and dying inside because we've, we've died to the good things of life instead of sometimes dying to the things that Christ is really asking us to die to, our attitudes and behaviors and ideologies that aren't of him. We can deny the impact of the past on our present not wanting to face some of the generational things in our lives, some of the, the sins and patterns and habits that have been passed down from great-grandparents to grandparents to parents to us. We see it come out in our relationships with others, um, in the way maybe that we speak to our kids or parent them, uh, the way we react to the people around us. And all of a sudden we realize like, oh my gosh, that is exactly like, I'm acting just like my mom. I'm acting just like my dad, right? In some of the areas that I didn't want to because we've ignored the past and its impact on us. Sometimes divide life into secular and sacred compartments where we, we compartmentalize our life as if faith doesn't affect all of it. Whether it's how we approach marriage, sexuality, money, care for the poor, our politics. The statistics say that for Christians, our life in many of these areas look just like the life of the world around us. Because we've compartmentalized life and said that Jesus Christ and his kingdom doesn't have anything to say to all of these different areas of our life. We do for God instead of being with him. We feel like our work for God is more important than stopping to pray and to be with him because there is so much need around us, right? It's not out of, out of callousness. It's out of a heart that wants to see the world around us transformed. And there's always so much we could be doing for him. But oftentimes that doing overshadows our being with him. 
We can spiritualize away conflict. We think that being a Christian means that we need to smooth over every conflict in life, or maybe even we tend to avoid conflict, sweep it under the rug. Few of us saw healthy conflict modeled when we were growing up, and so we tend to be a people who will lie, will blame, will attack others, say one thing to people's face and another behind their back, because we don't know how to deal with conflict in a healthy, loving, restorative way. We cover over our own brokenness and fear and weakness. We have this this need, this desire to present a life that seems to be in control and seems to be fine to other people. Like we have our life all together. And so we end up pretending like our weaknesses and our sin isn't actually there. Some of this, another sign of, of an unhealthy spirituality would be living without limits. The truth is we are not God, right? We are humans made in him, his image. But when God made humanity, he made us with some very specific limitations, Right? He designed us, and in our DNA is a need for sleep, is a need for rest, is a need for friendship and connection, is a need for food. We are not just robots or engines that can just keep perpetually going, but God designed us to have limitations. And so what does that mean for us in our walk with him? To be able to embrace the limits that he's placed in our lives as a gift and not something to fight to overcome. We can be a people who judge others, other people's spiritual journey. We tend to be really good at pointing out where other people have it wrong, right? Or maybe it's just me, right? We're very good at noticing other people and they've got their theology wrong, they've got their um, they've got their ideas about Jesus Christ wrong. They've got worship and church wrong. Uh, they've got their life wrong. We can feel really morally superior to those people over there who don't do things right. People who aren't in our denominational camp, our church camp, um, that don't have the same emphasis on worship or ministry or theology or social issues like us in our camp who have it right. There's this meme um, that I got sent in a text message. You might not be able to read it from there, um, but you've got this class going on about churches and Christian movements throughout history. You see that like the church began here over in 1 AD and now it says that, so this is where our movement came along and finally got the Bible right. And the, class, the person in the class says, Jesus is so lucky to have us. <laughs> right? We can be a people who think we finally arrived. Our camp got everything right about God and theology and church. And the reality is the, the church of Jesus Christ is wide and broad with a a wide variety of people and emphases. And we're all the one church under the heading of our one Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can be in a place where we judge other Christians who love Jesus. And instead of seeing them as brothers and sisters on a journey towards Jesus Christ, we see them as people who have it wrong and who need to be shaped and formed to look more like us, who have everything right. So Jesus is so lucky to have us. So do any of these signs or these symptoms, um, are any of these things that that seem familiar to you in your own life? These symptoms or signs of an unhealthy spirituality, these deficits, when they're left unaddressed, can lead us to having a shallow spirituality, a shallow spirituality that deals with that top 10% of the iceberg, or maybe we even dip down a little bit to try to deal with some of the below the surface stuff, but we never do that really deep, difficult dive of, of going down to the roots of who we are with Jesus Christ.
together we want to be a people who address these emotional and spiritual deficits. That we can be a people who take off that, that um, the facade that we feel like we need to wear that says we've got everything all together, uh, but instead we could be real about what's going on below the surface. That we'd feel comfortable exploring, doing that deep dive, knowing that Jesus Christ wants to bring freedom and wholeness and life to us. We started this, um, this journey with the staff a couple of years ago, the staff of the church. Um, about three years ago, we started going through uh, this book, The Emotionally Healthy um, Spirituality, because we wanted together as a team uh, to be able to see the Lord addressing those deep-rooted issues in us and helping us in our conflict, um, helping us deal with our emotions and limits. Um, and so we, we began this journey as a, a staff team. Um, and then even just this last year, we had the opportunity with a lot of you guys and a lot of the leadership of the church, uh, Bible study leaders and our council, to be able to get together and actually go through a class together. So we spent eight weeks um, as, as a group going through this book and some other materials to help us to, to slow down to be with Jesus and to see him actually do some transformation in our lives. And so now we're wanting to invite um, the entire congregation to join us in this journey, to join us in a journey of seeing Jesus do a good work in our lives. We want to not just deal with the, the top surface level stuff, but actually see Jesus do a work of transformation. We want to grow to be emotionally and spiritually mature humans, spiritually mature followers of Jesus, who slow down to be with Jesus, who go beneath the surface of our life to be deeply transformed by Jesus and offer our life as a gift to the world for Jesus. We want to slow down to be with Jesus, and so we want to learn together rhythms of silence and solitude, of listening and firsthand spirituality, that we have a firsthand relationship with Jesus uh, that's present and daily, like that daily bread that God offered uh, his, his people in the wilderness, that we're not dipping into like a a gift or a bread from God from a month or a year ago, but that this would be something daily in our lives that would feed us. As we slow down to be with Jesus, that our doing wouldn't outpace our being. Oftentimes we need to slow down to catch up with Jesus, right? Because we run out in our eagerness. Uh, we run out so far ahead of him. Uh, but together on this journey, we want to learn how to slow down to catch up with Jesus, to catch up to what God is doing in our lives, in our church, in the community of San Diego and the world around us. We want to go beneath the surface of our life to be deeply transformed by Jesus. The whole person, all areas of our life integrated together, the social part of our lives, intellectual, spiritual, emotional, physical, that instead of seeing these as separate parts, that we would have the entirety of our lives integrated together as a whole, and that we wouldn't ignore certain parts of those of our life as not needing to be discipled and shaped by Jesus, but instead we would mature in all areas of life. It is not selfish for us to examine what is going on inside what's going on beneath the surface. Because the reality is this is the location of so much of God's work in our lives. Jesus Christ in us, the Holy Spirit working in us. This kind of language is throughout all of the New Testament. And so ignoring the interior life, ignoring the reality of who we are, doesn't do us or God or the world around us any service. We want to be a people who are deeply transformed by Jesus Christ, that we would be a people who would confidently pray that prayer from Psalm 139, search me and know me, that God would know our hearts, would know our anxious thoughts, that he would, would know the, the painful paths in our lives and instead would lead us in his path, would lead us into the way of everlasting life. 
And then lastly, that we would be able to offer our lives as a gift to the world for Jesus Christ. Because why would we want to focus on all of this? Why would we want to focus on slowing down and going beneath the surface and dealing with our interior life? It's because we as a people long to see the goodness of God expressed to the world around us. And if we want to see that happen, we can't give out to the world something that we haven't experienced ourselves. If we want the world to experience goodness and wholeness, we as a people need to be shaped and transformed so that we are a people of goodness and who have experienced the wholeness of Jesus Christ. And that as we're on this journey with him, that the goodness of our lives together collectively as the church would be what Jesus Christ is able to gift to the world around us. Imagine the last two years if the church of Jesus Christ had lived emotionally mature and spiritually mature. Imagine the gift we could have been and the gift that many were, right? I don't want to undermine the fact that, that God did work through his church these last two years. But imagine if we came to the world without the volatility, if we came to the world um, at peace with who we are and a deep trust in Jesus Christ, the gift that we could have been to our friends, neighbors, communities, uh, to our schools and workplaces, communities that were very vitriolic, where there was violence and anger, selfishness and fear. Imagine the Church of Jesus Christ coming in a, a, a mature and a whole way to be present in those, those broken and conflicted areas of life. Imagine this, this list of, of what an emotionally mature Christian might look like. Imagine if these were the characteristics of the church. I'm just going to come up on the next slide. Um, imagine if this is what the church of Jesus Christ as a whole looked like and what our lives as a whole looked like. Imagine what this would mean to the world around us. I won't go through and read all of them, but, but some of them, imagine if we were so deeply convinced of Jesus's love for us that we weren't um, looking in unhealthy places to receive that love. Imagine if we truly loved our neighbor as ourself. And if that came out in the way we lived out our singleness or our marriage, Imagine if we were deeply in tune with our emotions and feelings, if we had empathy and we weren't in this place of feeling like we needed to fix or change or save people, if we could speak clearly, honestly, and respectfully for ourselves, if we could figure out how to express our anger, our hurt, our fear without blaming, appeasing, or holding grudges, if we walked in a community that respected each other's uniquenesses, we didn't become critical or defensive. We could live in truth and not pretense, spin, illusion, or exaggeration. We were able to negotiate, respect, and celebrate differences. We were willing to initiate and repair relationships as much as is possible when they've been ruptured. People around us are longing for this kind of health and wholeness for a different way to live, for a different way to be human, to live in the fullness of our humanity made in the image of God, the image of God that was called good at creation. We want to be discipled by Jesus, conforming to his image, growing and maturing in all ways, like we read in Ephesians 4, into the fullness of Jesus's stature. And as we do, this is what living out this good intention for humanity looks like. God's good intention for what human life and flourishing would be. This is what the world is longing for. And this is what we can see happen around us as the fullness of Jesus Christ and his spirit indwells his church, transforms us deep down, from the inside out in a way that affects all of our relationships and interactions with the world around us. The way we do friendships 
the way we handle our jobs and career and our schools, our politics, the pandemic, the fullness of everything that is our life. And the people around us would begin to be curious as they see the goodness of God on display. They'd be curious as to, to what has caused a people to relate so differently with each other. And that as they're curious, the Holy Spirit would be drawing them close to himself and that we would be able to, to help people to speak the truth so that people would know God. That they would know a God who has not only come to save them from the penalty of sin, but a God who has come to save them from the power of sin in their lives. The power of sin that distorts the goodness of God's intention for humanity, for our relationships, for our relating to one another. That sin that has, has broken us. That people would know a God who has come to save them from that power of sin so that the world would know Jesus Christ, would be made whole. And so I really hope that you guys will join us, that together as a church, that we could go on this journey together, uh, this journey with Jesus to slow down to be with him, go beneath the surface to be deeply transformed, and to offer our lives together as a gift to the world for Jesus. And so steps that we can take, um, would be not only engaging in the sermon series for the next seven weeks, um, but getting that book and reading through it, maybe meeting together with a cup, one person or a couple other people uh, to talk through the things that we're learning. And then also to, to join us next month when we kick off um, the class, the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course. So kind of under the umbrella of emotionally healthy discipleship, there's two courses that we want to go through this year. And the first one is going to be this emotionally healthy relationships course um, that is going to give us some really practical tools to live out the goodness of God in our relationships, um, whether that's with spouse or family members at work, um, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, uh, that we would be a people who love people like Jesus did and not just love some people that are easy to love, uh, but that we would be given some practical tools to love, especially the difficult people to love. And so change, we think change happens not only by taking in new information, uh, but also by being in relationship with people. And so this course, we're gonna sit around tables together, um, most likely in the courtyard outside as it starts to get a little warmer, um, that we'll sit around tables together, that there'll be six or eight people that you'll stay with over these eight weeks. Um, so as you're taking in new information, you've got a group of people to be able to talk with and process uh, through what we're learning. And then the, we're gonna put those practical tools into, um, into practice, into action over these next couple of months. We'll give you tools that you can actually use with the challenging relationships around you, and then we'll have a time to get back together again uh, to actually talk through and process what we learned and what we experienced. Because we think that that kind of the trifecta of, of new information, of being in relationship with others, and by actually practically living those tools out is gonna help to bring about lasting change with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so we invite you to join us for that course, and then in the fall, we'll launch the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course that will help us to, to deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ, to go deep, to slow down, to experience a firsthand spirituality with Jesus Christ. And so church, we, we love you and we are excited um, for these next few months and the next year and what the Holy Spirit might do in and through us as together we experience his goodness, his wholeness in our lives. I'm gonna invite Brittany and the worship team to come join us back up here. Um, and if you're able, would you stand with me this morning? Let's respond to God. Um, Respond to God by just submitting our lives before him anew. And so, Jesus Christ, we, we thank you for your loving care in our lives. Lord, we thank you that, that you do see what's below the surface. Um, and Lord, it doesn't 
cause you to turn your face away from us, but you know us more, um, more intimately and more fully than anyone else. You know us more intimately and fully than, than even ourselves, and you love all that you see. And so, God, would we experience your love, your acceptance of us, so that we can stand before you and allow you to do that deep, transforming work in us, that there'd no longer be parts of our lives that we feel we have to remain um, protective of or hide from you, but we would stand before you knowing that, that in your love you see all that we are and you long to help us to grow and mature to the full measure of Jesus Christ, that you long to bring freedom where we need freedom, to, to give us forgiveness where we need forgiveness, that you would strengthen the weak areas of our life, that you would speak a word of boldness and courage to the places of fear and timidity in us. And God, that we would boldly follow after you, knowing you doing a deep transformative work in us, and that this would be a gift to the people around us, to, to San Diego and to the world. God, do that work in us and through us, we pray. In Jesus Christ, mighty, powerful, beautiful name, amen.